Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, uh, my name is Paul Sell. I'm the Reengagement Systems Manager for the Youth Development Division, and uh, we're having attendees sign on right now. So we'll begin here in just a couple moments. And uh, Melissa, I'm just checking. It looks like my screen might be froze. Are we froze up? No? Okay. It looks okay to me. Perfect. All right. All right. So we'll go ahead and, uh, in interest of time, go ahead and get started. I know there'll be a few more attendees joining us here momentarily. But uh, just as um, we get things started, just a couple notes that uh, as participants, uh, you've all been muted and the video function for this webinar has been disabled. So you don't need to worry about turning on your camera or accessing it uh, at this point. Uh, those that you see on the screen are all part of our um, youth grants team for the youth development division. We'll get started here um, with introductions in just a moment. So um, Melissa, if you wouldn't mind moving to the next slide. Oops, for some reason it's not advancing quite yet. Ah, perfect. A little bit of technical difficulties, we'll get it started. But uh, as I said, my name is Paul Sell, I'm the Reengagement Systems Manager here for the Youth Development Division. Um, and you're joining us for the Reengagement Opportunity Grant uh, Request for Application webinar. And so our intent with this webinar is to give you as much information around the RFA uh, for reengagement as possible and help answer many of the questions that you might have from reviewing the released information last week. Uh, before we do some staff introductions, I would first like to acknowledge the many tribes and bands who call Oregon their ancestral territory and, on, and honor the ongoing relationship between the land, plants, animals, and people indigenous to this place we call home. We recognize the continued sovereignty of the nine federally recognized tribes who have ties to this place and the subsequent bands within those tribes and thank them for, for contributing and continuing to teach us how we might all be here together. And uh, as we begin the webinar, I do want to acknowledge we have several of our tribal members joining us today. So thank you for joining on the call. And with that, I'll turn it over to Brian Detman, our YDD director. Thanks so much, Paul and the rest of the team. My name is Brian Detman and I'm the Youth Development Division Director. It's my pleasure to uh, be on this call today and to be leading uh, this division, our team has put together a, a really strong um, request for applications for the re-engagement opportunity grant. Um, and I'm just excited that uh, we're able to come together uh, and provide this information. Um, I know it's been a long, more than a year um, of, of, of uh, isolation and, and, and folks working uh, in these virtual spaces. Uh, and so, as much as uh, we're all eager to be able to share information in person, we are excited to be able to bring this information to you in this format. Um, we do feel like it, it does um, allow us to engage um, and involve um, quite a few people around the state. Um, so, again, we're just excited to be able to provide this information. And I just want to say a real deep, um, heartfelt thanks to um, to Paul and Jared and Abraham and Bill and Molly, as well as Cord and Noemi uh, in procurement. We just, I appreciate all the work that y'all have done up to this point. So thanks so much. Um, look forward to um, all the information that's gonna be provided and I'll turn it back over to you, Paul. Thanks. Thank you, Brian, uh, for that introduction. And I'll turn it over to, uh, to begin interactions with Cord. Hi, everybody. This is Cord Buecher, Acting Chief of Staff for the Youth Development Division. Um, I am going to be tracking your questions today. Uh, if you have a question, please type it into the box. And um, what we're going to do is periodically pause during this presentation, and I'm going to read those out to the presenter, and, uh, and either the presenter or someone they call on will answer the questions. Uh, we've already got one in here, so you might see there's a question. Is it possible to adjust the online application. I won't read the whole thing. Um, we'll actually save that for when we get to our first uh, time doing that. So 
Um, again, you'll hear my voice periodically, and we appreciate you participating and uh, asking us questions as we move along. And I'll go ahead and name the next person, um, Bill. Good afternoon, I'm Bill Hansel, um, Youth Policy Analyst with the Youth Development Division, and I will um, disappear here shortly, but if uh, called upon or can assist, I'll reappear and, and chime in and, and uh, look forward uh, to our presentation. Thank you. Uh, how about Jared? Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jared Shaw. I am Workforce Policy Analyst and Grant Manager with YDD, and I will turn it over to Molly. Hello, everybody. I'm Molly Burns, Reengagement Grants Manager. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I'll turn it over to Noemi. Hello, everyone. My name is Noemi Rios, and I work with the Youth Development Division in the Procurement Unit, and I am the single point of contact for this grant opportunity. So that means if you have questions outside of this session, please email me your questions so that we can get them uh, responded to. And looking at the timeline from the RFA, the written questions need to be submitted to me no later than 1 p.m. on Friday, June 25th. And I believe we'll provide more information on that a little bit later in the presentation. Uh, let's go to Abe. Hi, everybody. I'm Abraham Magana. I'm the Community Investments Grant Manager. Uh, probably seeing some of you tomorrow. Um, I'll go ahead and pass it up to Melissa, actually. Hello, everyone. My name is Melissa Gallardo. I'm executive support for the YDD team. I'm happy to be here today. Um, thank you all for being here. And like Bill, I will be off camera, but I'll be behind the scenes progressing our slides, etc. Back to you, I think, Paul. Absolutely. So thank you, everyone, for introductions. And so you'll notice that uh, most of the staff will probably disappear off the screen, as they indicated. Um, and uh, Molly and Jared will hang with me as we go through the presentation. I see one of the questions around some bullet points of the rundown of exactly what needs to be submitted. And that's exactly what we'll start uh, kind of running through on that. So Melissa, if you want to give me the next uh, slide, please. All right. And so uh, as you've already started doing, I appreciate it. So uh, putting the questions in the question box is wonderful. That way we can track them as well as make sure that we respond throughout the presentation within it. Um, and also, one of the things you'll notice on the screen is that you'll start seeing some screenshots of SM Applied. We recognize that many of our callers may already have a uh, SurveyMonkey Applied account as part of the reporting process for the YDD, but we also have many new users, and so we wanted to make sure to try to capture that information throughout. Uh, I'll also note, you may notice us looking to the sides of our screen. Um, we are monitoring the chat and the questions to try to address them as we go through, so please do keep those coming forward as needed uh, within that work. All right, so Melissa, next slide, please. So just a brief introduction to YDD and YDC. Um, our vision is that Oregon youth have the opportunity to thrive and achieve their full potential. Our mission is to align systems and invest in communities to ensure equitable and effective services for youth ages 6 through 24. And uh, through both throughout Oregon and the tribal nations, we support education and career success, disrupting youth crime and violence, and really focused on affirming youth strengths and their safety. Uh, next slide, please. This next slide is, is really just defining who Youth Development Division is, and we are a state agency carrying out the strategic direction from the Youth Development Council or the YDC. So that's why we're here presenting today. We have some general funding priorities, again, focused around identifying and removing system barriers and gaps and reducing disparities and achieving equitable outcomes for youth along the way. Next slide, please. So today, um, I wanted to make sure that we just took a moment to really show our, our youth grants portfolio. As Abe indicated, there's a community investment RFA information session tomorrow at, on June 4th. And those are four separate initiatives uh, that many of our grantees may have received this, this past biennium. Today, we're really focused on the requirements around re-engagement and the re-engagement opportunity grants. Uh, just a couple of notes uh, as before we move to the next slide is, is that we encourage current grantees to take a look at their current grant and see if they're in the community investment or the re-engagement 
um, grant opportunities to really help begin to identify which grant opportunity you may choose to apply for. I also want to note that there are many definitions around re-engagement and re-engagement specifically throughout the state and throughout the nation. And uh, the re-engagement grants that we're specifically talking around are focused on high school completion and GED and or GED completion for youth ages up to 21. Um, and there's lots of opportunities that you have in there to help support and remove barriers, but educational component is a required piece of re-engagement. And so with that, I'll go ahead and move to the next slide. And to help address some of the burning questions that I know that are probably coming in through the chat, um, is that the RFA is due Tuesday, July 13th, 2021 at 1 p.m. Uh, through SMOPLY. SMOPLY is a application system that's open 24 hours a day, but uh, you need to make sure that you hit the green submit button in, uh, in SMOPLY by 1 p.m. on July 13th. Uh, new to uh, these applications, app organizations can submit more than one application. It will be uh, a responsibility of the successful applicants to document how the multiple grants they serve or they, they receive serve different programmatic and participant needs. Um, prior to a first claim being submitted, there's three main areas that will have to be completed, and that's an executed grant agreement, which will happen shortly after the intent to award notifications go out. Um, another process, which many of you already have in EGIMS or an electronic grant management system uh, sign in, uh, but that, all that processing and approvals will have to be done for our new organizations before claims can be submitted. And as outlined in the RFA, a work plan will be created after an executed grant agreement is completed. Um, as part of our um, movement uh, and, and focus, we are trying to make sure that uh, grant, uh, grantees will be able to re reimburse grant costs from July 1, 2021. And that's pending YDD approval next week, or the YDC approval, excuse me, next week as part of our council presentation. But uh, that is to help kind of uh, let you know that we are trying to um, help aid uh, grantees with that kind of um, lack of funding there between an executed grant agreement and the end of this biennium grants. Uh, the organizations who receive funds, uh, mainly our grants are reimbursement based. And so grantees will su may submit reimbursement requests up to once per month on that and a schedule will be outlined to successful grantees. As part of the re-engagement opportunity grants, uh, it's very exciting to say that we have a, up to 25% of the total grant award that can be requested for initial funding. Jared will cover how those funds are documented in the budget um, proposal submitted as part of the application later in this presentation. And then as uh, Noemi indicated, so during the presentation, please do add your questions to the chat box. Um, we hope to address many of them through this presentation, but, uh, and then Cord will jump on periodically to uh, help us address some of the more questions that might not have been addressed in the presentation itself. And then after the presentation, Noemi is our single point of contract and her uh, email address is listed in the RFA documents for it. And then uh, once we're finished with these presentations, as well as all of the questions submitted uh, after, uh, we will publish a official question and answer document on or around July 2nd. Next slide, please. With that, I'll turn it over to Molly to get, dive more into the specifics of the re-engagement grant itself. Okay, thanks, Paul. So, hey, Molly, can I ask you just, I'm sorry to mess oh, your flow oh. up. I just want to pause. Um, I apologize. We're going to try to do questions in between each presenter. Um, so I wanted to stop because I've already got about 15 questions here. So I want to read these out. Just really quickly, I don't know that we can answer all of them right now, um, but I'll just, if I'll answer them and or read them and Paul or anyone else if you want to jump in and answer these. Absolutely. In the order we got them, um, there is a question about, uh, you know, I'm going to pause again because I'm looking, the questions are kind of all over the place. And Molly, I apologize again, because I think based on the variety of questions I have here, and the number, it might be better for us just to move through and just save questions for closer to the end of this presentation. Uh, Paul, Molly, does that sound good to both of you? It, it does, Gord. Actually, I can answer a couple of them, I think, that aren't answered in the questions. I have it up on my screen here. So the question around um, adjusting the online application system to be able to move back and forth between sections, uh, that is something that we'll have to research to see if that is um, able with how we currently have it set up. So Annie, you asked that question and we'll we'll take a look at that uh, 
later this week, early next week, to see if we can adjust it without affecting uh, affecting the application that's already been started. Uh, apologize that we can't move between those sections currently. Okay, I'll mark that one done, and I'll I'll just keep track of these. We will definitely either respond to these in the call, and if we have to get back with an answer, we'll do that too. And I will cut my mic off and let Molly take it back. Thank you. Sorry about that. Absolutely. Go ahead, Molly. All right. Thank you. Um, so just to give you an idea of the purpose um, and scope on the next couple slides for the re-engagement re opportunity grant, um, the re-engagement opportunity grants serve uh, serve local communities to re-engage in education youth ages 14 to 21 who left high school or are at risk of leaving high school before earning a high school diploma or its equivalent with the goal of assisting youth to achieve um, their high school diploma or GED credential. And these re-engagement opportunity grants are a part of the Oregon statewide youth re-engagement system being built in Oregon. The overarching goals of this are on the slide listed here. So the first goal is uh, to reconnect youth back to education through outreach and supports to aid retention. Another goal is the delivery of specialized education, training, and support services that lead to increased high school graduation and GED completion for re-engaged youth in Oregon. Another goal is strengthened and supported career pathways and post-secondary education and training. And another goal is part of the statewide youth re-engagement system is building collaboration networks. So really building collaboration and connections among all the different people and entities who are doing this work in order to reduce disconnection as well as create opportunities and positive outcomes for youth. Next slide. Thanks. Um, and so you'll you'll note that the reengagement opportunity grants award range is twenty thousand to two hundred and forty thousand thousand. And at this point, we just wanted to pause to note that in the RFA and the section 2.4, the scope of activity is found. And the scope of activity really describes what a successful applicant will be expected to do. And so you can see the list on the slide right here. And then as we move through the presentation, we'll be touching on some of these as we go further on. All right, thank next you, Molly. Slide. Yeah, thank you, Molly. And uh, next slide, please, Melissa. I'm also going to pause here for a moment to try to answer a few of these questions that maybe not be in there. So, yes, uh, Cord will post uh, information, the link to tomorrow's information session uh, as one of those questions. We'll get that posted in the chat for you as well. You can also find it on the YDD website under Community Investment Grants. Um, can applicants apply for both community investments and re engagement opportunities? Yes, both uh, applicants can apply for uh, both of those grants, um, but it would need to be defined as to what how those services are different because you wouldn't want to be serving the same youth and the same program programmatic needs uh, with the, with separate grant funds. Um, scrolling back up here. Um, making so i think for right there we'll go ahead and uh, oh there's a question about dates and time so apologize for the confusion we threw out several different dates and times with it at the end of the slide presentation we'll have a very clear recap of exactly all the times due there are separate time uh, due dates for questions to be submitted questions to be responded and then the full application is due uh, july 13th um, and we'll we'll capture that at the end. You can also find it in section 1.4 of the RFA uh, with those detailed dates and times. So the next uh, couple slides are really around um, SM Apply or Survey Monkey Apply and and when you access that information. So you'll notice here that uh, this is the, the online application system that we use for our grants. And uh, that first top screen picture there, uh, you'll notice that there's a login and a register. So many people already have 
a login. And so even applying or reporting, you'll use the same login, just select that, that tab and it'll take you to your standard login screen for SM Apply. If you have yet to register for, for this application, uh, you'd select the green registration button and then you would enter a few um, important details of your name, organization, and um, email address in order to create an account. That bottom picture there is the, the program itself. You'll notice that there are two grants listed. And again, it's small screen pictures, so apologize for that. Um, but uh, those are the two separate grants that are currently open to RFAs. And so you would select uh, for this one specifically, you'd select the bottom one, which is the 2021-23 Reengagement Opportunity Grant, and you move to this next screen, which will take you into the beginning of the application. Uh, and that also brings a point that these are biennium grants that I wanted to, to talk just quickly about, that these are two-year biennium grants. So any of the things that you're doing, you're looking over the course of the next two years. So the grants begin uh, July 1, 2021, and then they would end June 30, 2023. And so all of your planning and preparation would be within those that two-year window. So once you go into the SM Apply window, there's a couple important pieces with this slide. Um, you'll notice on the left-hand side of your screen is what's called the navigation bar and, or the navigation box. And inside that, that'll change depending on where your application is. One of the important pieces here is that if you are not the sole person doing this application, you will want to add a collaborator. And by doing that, you'll enter in their email address and their name, and it'll send them an invite to be a part of this application for you. And then they would be able to uh, access the application to the restrictions that you give them accessibility to. Once you move in, there are three tasks, and that's on the kind of bottom right-hand side. You'll notice task one is applicant eligibility, task two is grade out, and that's the applicant information, and then task three is review and submit. So uh, as you go through it, the, the first task does need to be required before the second task begins. Um, I believe the question around moving in between those um, items in each task, we will look into that and see if we can fix that uh, as an option for it. All right, next slide, please. So now some just some quick pieces around SM Apply. Um, you'll notice this green circle at the bottom of the screen. Um, you may need to use your scroll bar when you're in SM Apply to find that in the application itself, but you want to save regularly and you save by hitting the save and continuing it editing button. Uh, the next button is the green button in the green circle, and that will not work if your task is not complete or the format is incorrect or you've gone over your word count. Each of the responses have a specific word count that you need to be aware of, and so you'll want to make sure on that. Um, the main piece of this screen, you'll notice the navigation bar is on the left-hand side. It has changed because you're in a different setting, but on the right-hand side of the screen, uh, the red circle and the blue circle are kind of two important pieces. Um, in that whole text box, you can hit hide, and those are instructions. That includes the links as part of the uh, application itself, as well as what task you're involved in, as well as just general instructions on how to save and, and review your work. The um, blue circle highlights the um, SM Apply that has links within the, each application, so you can access different parts of the, the RFA or the um, budget and those apps those applications that will be required as part of the application. Next slide, please. This next slide um, with that blue circle shows the navigation bar. And so a couple of pieces to note that if you want to go back in and review task one, you would just select task one and it'll take you back to that. This, uh, and it's shown that it's complete by the green circle with the check inside. Task two is the current one that this has been selected for. It's, it's noted by the green circle with that half full green button. You want to re-access that, you can go ahead and select that link and take it back in. Once you've completed your application, this submit button down here at the bottom part of the screen in the blue circle will turn green, and that is the button that will officially submit your application in SM Apply. The green circle is just the scroll bar. Just wanted to point that out that, that you want to use that to be able to see the different functions within each screen. And then lastly, this red circle here at the bottom of the screen uh, is highlighting the text box where your responses will be put into SM Apply. You can use a copy and paste function from any word processing tool or online word processing tool that you would like and simply paste your answers and responses into this. Uh, please do review your responses once you paste it. Um, just a note that the plain text um, only 
you should not be using graphics tables or pictures because that will not allow you to save. Um, so next slide, please. So with that, actually, I want to pause real quickly for just to check in. Were there any questions of SM Applied that we wanted to address quickly? Yeah, so I've actually, um, there's a few that I was able just to provide answers for that I've provided in the Q&A module, but there's a few I want to read out um, just to kind of get a quick take, uh, I guess, from you, Paul. Um, so a uh, question about youth assessment of eligible youth. What are the options? Uh, I, I presume it's if we have recommendations for how one would assess eligibility. you have any thoughts on that? So a lot of the eligibility pieces, we'll cover that in, in a slide here coming up, but a lot of the eligibility pieces are coming from the educational entity that is helping um, either monitor or track or help find students um, within that work. So that's what we've typically seen in many of our grants uh, that are currently working with that. Okay. Um, and then are we going to cover the community partner letters and any requirements in those letters in this presentation? Um, we'll briefly touch it, but really those that letter of intent to partner is just indicating that uh, you have met with that partner or discussed with that partner options and their commitment within the grants. Uh, one of the questions that Molly will cover later, we'll talk specifically around um, detailing what, your, what the re-engagement partner would uh, be doing as part of it. Um, all right. Let me see here. So I've been trying to make sure I move through these in order because I've gotten a pretty good number of questions. Um, let's see. So um, can funds be used to pay rent for the space or a percentage of the cost of the space where programming is being delivered? Um, typically, yes. Garrett will cover in more detail and uh, the um, budget uh, worksheet that is included as part of the application materials have definitions for what is allowable for each budget category. Um, our uh, equipment funds are the restrictions around what they can be used for. The example, um, could musical instruments be an uh, equipment purchase? Uh, if it's uh, tied to the overall grant plan, yes. And so one of the things that the um, applicant will want to do is to talk about how those funds are being used to reconnect youth and how it's part of their overall plan uh, as part of their, their overall project. Cool, thanks. Hey, um, I don't know if, I think, Abe, you, if you're on the call or anyone, can you drop a link in the chat to tomorrow's session? We have a question about that. Yeah, I'll go ahead and drop it. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, um, I saw one of the questions around GED and high school completion. Those all fit into the same category. Uh, so really, youth can be accessing the GED, can, uh, component or that high school completion component, which Molly will cover in a little bit more detail here shortly. Or it might be my slide, I'm not sure. Um, so I there's a question here that I want to maybe hold off on right now, which is kind of about, you know, specifics of programming and which application to apply for. Um, that one might be a little harder for us to answer off the cuff. Sure. Um, are there school districts that have been awarded a re-engagement grant in the past? To my knowledge, yes. Yes, and you can view all of the awarded applicant or for the current re-engagement on our website. Uh, a list of those uh, awardees are, are under the re youth re-engagement tab. Um, and Molly, your presentation was all on, uh, that was in the slideshow, so and we'll be sharing the slideshow, correct? Yes, and actually, if you can access it, I had loaded it into the handouts. Um, so please, if you have access to the handouts, uh, please let us know. Um, I'm not sure the capabilities of GoTo on that piece. If not, it will be posted on our website for the next week. Uh, all of the details that I gave are in the RFA document itself. Got it. Thank you, Molly. Um, I'm going to, let's see, I'm going to pause here and uh, we'll let you get back to the presentation and I'll keep tracking where we're at on the questions. Thanks. Sounds good. Thank you, Corey, for monitoring that. There's, uh, and please do keep those questions coming. We want to, we want this to be as uh, useful for uh, all of our participants on the call uh, as possible. And so, one of the questions that I saw in the in the chat was to kind of hit the bullet points. And so, the next four slides is really around the required um, components as to receive re-engagement funds. So one of the first ones is applicant eligibility. You can see here a bulleted list of all the different organizations 
and entities that are automatically eligible to apply. This last bullet on the screen uh, is that you've received YDD approval to apply and you would want to see the RFA for um, more details on what that looks like. On the right side of the screen is what the SM Apply screen will look like. Simply, it, you will fill in the circle uh, for what type of entity you are, and then hit Save and move to the next piece. Next slide, please. So I, I've seen a several questions around eligible youth, and so you can see here on the screen, this screenshot on the left side, that big box is the four different categories that are outlined in the legislation for eligible youth to receive re-engagement dollars as part of these grants. So that first bullet there, youth ages 14 through 21, who are defined as a dropout and not exempt from attending public school. I do want to, I, I chose that one specifically to note that we recognize that the COVID um, response in schools has not to been dropped students. Uh, and so that has been a bit of a challenge with these last grants, but we anticipate that coming back uh, the next year. Um, but you'll look at that category and then in the drop down, you'll need to select if that's uh, a, a eligible youth that you anticipate serving or you're going to be serving or currently do that you don't anticipate serving that or that at the current time it's unknown. And so you'll go through each of those four eligible youth uh, criteria using uh, the drop down menu to select serves, will not serve or unknown. And then at, at the completion of that, there's a short response. Describe how you will verify the eligibility of youth participating in your re-engagement services. Please note that this is a 50-word limit. We're, it's, it's to meet those minimum requirements of the legislation. And so a couple examples of that might be if you are partnering with the school district, then you, you might have some sort of short response that would say, through our partnership with uh, such and such school district, we will be verifying youth uh, progress in school. Or status. If you're a school district, you might be verifying it through your own records on that piece. Uh, next slide, please. Also to note, um, you'll notice in the parentheses at the top of, of each title uh, is where it is located in the RFA for the specific details on it. So the next required uh, piece of this uh, of this grant is required re-engagement services. And uh, you'll notice here that uh, successful applicants are required to provide one or more of the following services. So we do anticipate that you may select not a planned service uh, in some of these categories. Um, so there's definitions for each of these six categories in the RFA, as well as in SM Apply as part of the questions. So an example that uh, people may fill out is an outreach services and the one-on-one -on -one academic or career coaching might be what you're applying for as an applicant. So you would fill that in as an applicant uh, and stating that that'll be your responsibility. Educational services may be through a partnership with a school district or other educational service. And so you would say that that was a re-engagement partner. For the other three services, those may not be planned as part of your application. So you would simply mark not a planned service within that. Next slide, please. High school completion, as we saw, talked about earlier in this, um, you can see the educational services, what they include on the bottom part of that screen. Uh, part of the screening process will just be a simple uh, short response describing how high school completion programming will be accessible to re-engaged re-engagement youth. And again, if that if you're partnering with the school district, that may be uh, the, the short response that you would provide within that work. Next slide, please. And the last uh, uh, screening requirement is a re-engagement partner. And so part of our legislation identifies that re-engagement partner, uh, or at least one re-engagement partner must be a part of the services or providing one or more of the re-engagement services. And so as part of that, that'll be the either a signed MOU or a signed letter of intent. There is a sample letter of intent to partner uploaded as part of the application materials for you to review. Uh, in, in regards to that, then your short response on that screening question would be just to describe your role, uh, describe the role of the re-engagement partner on that work. So with that, I believe Molly is up next, but I want to pause to see if there are other questions that Cord uh, wanted to bring forth. Sure, yeah, I was just getting some like written responses in to follow up on what we just uh, touched on. Um, so I've got a question here about repeating the registration process. I know that, that this there will be a video of, a pre of this presentation that's going to get posted to, to the website um, on the page where our, our application materials are. So you'll have another chance to review that. And if you visit SM Apply, it should also provide you with some instructions to walk you through. 
Um, a question about the difference between re-engagement and youth promise grants in terms of serving students at risk of disengagement. Um, I mean, this is a similar question to, I think, the same individual asked a different way about this. Um, I mean, my, my, my response earlier, and I think I would say this for now is maybe the best response we can give is look at the requirements of each of the two RFAs and really think about the specific things that your program is doing and what may fit better. Um, I suspect that there are programs that are um, dropout prevention oriented that may also fit within the re-engagement grant scope, but, but, but there are some that might really be more appropriate in the Youth Promise category. Uh, I don't know that we could provide a, a you know, consistent uh, response for every single possible program that might overlap the two. So I think that that would be what I would say is just to review each application to see where you feel like you are the best fit. Um, I can add a little bit more definition to that too. Is yeah, that, please. Um, for the re-engagement there, the, the categories we just covered are specific to the re-engagement grants themselves. So the eligible use, so use served by these dollars would need to be able to be verified within the eligible youth categories. And so that may be a difference. So if you're serving youth that are at risk of disengagement, but don't beat those eligible categories, that may be a, you might want to look at the community investment grants as an option. It also doesn't have the edu youth uh, promise grants and the community investment grants do not have the educational requirement uh, included in that as well. So depending on the program, again, like Ford is saying, to re definitely review the requirements of each. Hey, Paul, another question. Um, uh, can you just talk about, um, we have a question, what are startup funds? Mm -hmm. And I'm, I suppose that it is new for some folks who've received our grants before. Can you just talk a little bit about how those work and what the expectations are? Absolutely. That's a that's a great question. Um, so startup funds uh, or initial funds is, is, I think, the technical term that's in the grants uh, grant agreement. And they're really designed to be uh, as a as upfront funds to be able to programming uh, programs to really get that work started. So there might be some big purchases or some things that are needed uh, prior to getting to a reimbursement to help fund those options. And so it's just an option that we've added, not required uh, that applicants can use. Uh, to receive those funds early and then they would report after they've done those purchases or use those funds uh, as part of their uh, quarterly and startup fund report so it's, it's a different option that's not reimbursement based got it um Perfect. so i'm trying to get back to my, my list and order here um is in the case of a collaborative effort between like nonprofit, school district, and ESD, is there a preference for which entity should be the principal applicant, or is it uh, all the same? I actually I don't believe there is. I think that would be a discussion you'd want with your partners to see which would make the most sense as, uh, as part of the application. So, um, but no, we cool. don't have any preference points uh, associated with that. Cool. I'll, I'll answer the next question. Oh, uh, I did answer uh, a couple of others. There will be a confirmation email sent when you submit your application. Um, is there an age range? Is the age range for sure? There was previous talk of it being 14 to 24 instead of 14 to 21 due to a bill. Um, I can actually, I'll put my email in the chat. Happy to talk more about this. Our bill has passed, um, but we still have to implement the bill. And part of that work will be over the coming biennium. Uh, we have to develop the administrative rules and otherwise figure out how we will expand the age range and re-engagement, how that will impact the grants, et cetera. So for these grants right now, the age limit is 14 to 21, um, but ultimately at some point, either within this biennium or um, in, by 2023, uh, we'll be implementing that. And that's just some work that we will, will have, but the bill has, has passed, the governor has signed it, but it will take some time for us to roll that out in terms of impacting programming. And I can answer more questions offline. I'll put my info for any, any other questions on the bill. Other RFA questions should go to the single point of contact. But if you want to know about the legislation, Senate Bill, excuse me, House Bill 2051, that I can talk to you all day about. Um, so let's see, uh, must grant activities continue for two years or maybe propose expending the total grant in less than two years? No, I, actually, maybe I can see if Noemi might be able to help address that on the procurement side. Nope, doesn't look like she's on. We'll get back to you. Oh. Sorry, I couldn't unmute myself. <laughs> oh, no worries. Thank you, Noemi. So the intended performance period for the um, resulting grants 
is July 1, 2021 until June 30th, 2023. So when you submit the required documentation and budget, you should fill it out for that time period. Um, how it'll be scored, I will let the program respond to that if you are requesting funds for less than the full two years that we're intending to have the grant uh, performance period be. But the resulting grant agreement will have the details of um, exactly when the grant funds can be expended. Thank you, Naomi. And um, so one of the things I will kind of note on that one is I think that's a piece that we'll want to talk about with as a re-engagement and grants team. So we'll have to get some clarification on that answer uh, at the Q&A. So thank you, Manny. That's a great question. On that. With that, I'll turn it back to uh, Molly. And I believe we need the next slide, Melissa, please. Okay, thanks. Uh, so after you complete task one in the application, uh, right when you go into task two, you'll be entering some applicant information. So at first you'd be asked to provide your business address and if different, your service address and the counties where the proposed services will take place. Um, please note, we will talk a little bit more um, at the end of this presentation if the business and service um, addresses don't match. So please hold questions on that just for a minute here. Um, and then other applicant information is you'll be asked to put in program personnel information and the name, title, telephone number, email for people with various roles. And um, but for smaller organizations that may have people serving in more than one capacity, um, you have to complete all the fields. And so it's fine for you to put the name of that person who's fulfilling multiple roles within your organization on this on this page. Next slide, please. Okay, so then um, the next part of the application will contain the application narrative, what I always call the application questions. So this is the scored part of your RFA. Um, we may have mentioned, um, we noted the word count already, um, but just a couple notes to highlight. Um, in your, the application narrative, you must complete and submit a response to all six questions and you really want to read all sub bullets and look and see what they're asking for a complete response. And also when you're writing the application narrative, you want to be sure to use definitive verbs to describe what you will do rather than using aspirational verbs such as hopes, expects, or intend. Um, so just, uh, just please note that in the RFA as well. Next slide, please. So this slide shows you what the six application um, questions are. And you'll note that the word counts are different for each question. And the maximum points that you can be awarded for each question is also different. Um, finally, please note, this is the place on evaluation item five, re-engagement partnerships, where you will upload that um, MOU or letter of intent to partner. And as Paul mentioned, there is a sample in the RFA packet um, in one of the attachments. Uh, there's an illustration of what a letter of intent to partner will look like. Okay, next slide. This slide basically shows um, what the evaluation items are going to look like in SM Apply. And so you can see the word limit is there. There's multiple bullets. So you want to make sure you're reading everything. And I'll just um, put your attention on that first bullet where the term eligible youth is capitalized. And so in the RFA, if we're using any terms, they're going to be capitalized. So you want to pay attention to that. And then in, I think it's in section 2.2 where these terms are actually defined. 
And then down at the bottom is that text field where you will be putting in your responses. And you can see it's kind of small, so you can click and drag on the bottom right corner, and that will expand that field um, for easier viewing. Okay, let's see. Oh, next slide, please. One more. Okay, so after the application narrative um, in task two, you will get the projected outcomes chart. What you see on the slide is just a screenshot of the top of the chart. The complete chart is in the RFA um, attachment B. So it's part of the, attach, uh, the, the RFA application. And here you will be asked to project the number of youth to be served by the proposed programming in the various re-engagement areas. And so the numbers that you're putting in the projected outcomes chart should align with what you're describing in the application narrative responses. Um, in this chart, you're being asked to report two year totals. So we wanted to avoid some programs reporting um, projected one year totals and others too. So you are asked to report a total of two year totals. And you'll notice that there's two columns here so that you will be reporting separately the numbers um, of youth served from the re-engagement program, direct services, and the number of youth served by your re-engagement partners. And so um, there's no expectation that you're gonna have numbers in all of these fields. So you can put NA for not applicable, whereas service will not be provided. Or you might have the case where you're providing the educational services and you're partnering with somebody for case management. So in that case, for example, in line four, um, for numbers of you served in case management for you, you could put not applicable, and then you put your partner's numbers in the partner list for that case management item there. Okay, did we want to pause for questions or um, go on to budget? <laughs> so if we don't mind, um, Cord and I are both trying to respond to questions in the chat. Um, so maybe if we can keep going and then we'll do a quick recap because we are getting close to our uh, timeline. So if that works for you both, I suggest. Cord, was there anything that was burning that needed to be addressed immediately? Um, I think one that you might be able to say something about um, is a question about, you know, programs that are serving a smaller number of youth with more intensive services. To my knowledge, there's not a preference for scale, uh, but can you talk a little about that? Um, the question is, is there a preference for number of kids served or acuity of kids served? Um, and, and, and like I said, you know, higher need and more intensive services for smaller number of youth. Is that okay? So, yes, actually, Cord, that was the question that I was working on in the tiny box to respond. Um, okay. the, the short answer is there is not a preference um, points within that. Um, you can still absolutely be considered. Uh, in the budget narrative, it kind of outlines uh, a cap of around 3,000 per youth uh, served in terms of your grant request. But in the budget narrative, applicants can actually explain why they have increased uh, costs associated with that. So there isn't, it's not an actual cap, it's just you, you want to describe what it is. So smaller organizations we recognize is going to cost uh, more money per youth. And so that would be a place that you would describe it. And I believe Jared will talk a little bit more about that in his portion of it. Got it. Um, and uh, there's one other thing I thought we might be able to answer quickly, which is um, our current grantees able to resubmit for previously say resubmit a previously submitted application in an effort to continue an initiative already in play keeping in mind updating targets and some information may be required i mean I, I think that the answer is you can submit a new application for a current um a service a program being supported but you should re review and answer the questions in this new application because it's different is that mm -hmm. going to cover it paul Yes, so that uh, my yes, I am on mute. It's a tiny little box I want to make sure. Um, so yes, the short answer is um, current applicants should use that current programming as part of their application. The application in SMFI is slightly different and been adjusted. Similar question, so you'd want to definitely answer or it's specific to the as the questions are phrased. The bullet points and stuff have been updated and edited. 
Got it. I'll let y'all get back to the presentation. I'll keep looking through these. Thank you. I'll go back looking at them as well. Okay, I think I have the next part. Uh, Melissa, if we could thank you. All right, so this next part of the application is going to be uploading your budget. Um, that will also be part of task two. This is not a scored uh, part of the application, but it is still required just so we know how much money you're requesting and what we're working with. Um, when you download the budget template, you can find that on the website where the RFA is posted, and that's attachment D. Um, you'll download it. You'll notice that there are a couple tabs in the workbook. It may open and it may show you the budget um, tab first, but the first tab is this right here. This is a screenshot of the budget category definitions. This is gonna be really helpful as you go into your budget and you start populating your line items. This is gonna be a description of what goes in those line items. So take a look at this first before you start entering that information. We get a lot of questions, for instance, on does this count as supplies and materials versus equipment? And some of those questions will be answered here. So this will be a good guide as you work on your budget. Uh, next slide, please. So this will be the next tab. This is the main budget tab where you're gonna enter your numbers. Um, pretty straightforward, but a few things to note here. Um, up at the top, you'll see some information. Some of that you will not know and you won't have yet. You'll see grant manager, you'll see subgrant number. Don't worry about that. The two main things to worry about here are organization and SMA number. Organization is clearly just your the title of your organization, and the SMA number is that number that is associated with your SM Apply application. And there's another uh, screenshot going forward where I'll call that out, and you'll see what number that is. Um, amount requested at the top, um, you'll see that'll be the total amount that you are requesting for your funds. And you'll also see down at the bottom total budget with that green box to the right of it. When you're finished populating your budget, those two cells should match. If they do not, total budget at the bottom, that will turn red. And before you submit your application, if that number is red, that means that it's not matching with the amount requested. So you need to go back and revise that. The other thing to pay attention to on this is also the grantee administrative costs line. You'll see to the right of that, there is a red box where it says 22.22%. When you have your total amount requested listed and you're entering your administrative costs, it will automatically calculate the percentage of the admin costs out of the total budget. You'll see in the note below here, it says administrative costs may not exceed 15% of the total budget or your federally negotiated indirect rate, whichever is more. So unless you have a federally negotiated indirect rate that's more than 15%, this box to the right should say 15% or less and it should be green. If you have a federally negotiated indirect rate that is greater and you're gonna use that for your administrative costs, that, that box will be red, um, but that's okay. Just, just note that, um, that your, your admin costs will need to be your federally negotiated rate or less, and you would need to submit uh, supporting documentation to show that that is your rate. Um, next slide, please. This is just a continuation of that screenshot. At the bottom, you'll see a uh, request for startup budget. Paul uh, alluded to this earlier. This is similar to the admin costs up above. If you're requesting startup funds, you would put the amount there and it's gonna automatically calculate to the right what percent of the total budget that startup fund um, is. It should not exceed 25. Did someone say something? I think I'm just hearing myself in background, sorry. <laughs> um, it should not exceed 25%. If it does, that will turn red and that means you need to go back and revise. Um, so that should be 25% or less. Another important thing to note about the startup budget is that it is not gonna be a separate tab on the template. It's gonna be incorporated into these line items up above. So if you're requesting $100,000 total for your budget and you're allocating 10,000 to startup costs, those 10,000 should be up included in you know, personnel, operating, supplies and materials, so on and so forth, um, it will be integrated into those line items. So just keep that in mind as you're building your budget. Next slide, please. Uh, next step would be the budget narrative. This is pretty simple. It is what it sounds like. It's just a narrative explaining what your budget is. The three most important things are those bullets there, a description of how each budget line item was determined identification of roles and responsibilities for any staff funded by the grant, and an explanation of increased need if the budget reflects a request of more than $3,000 per estimated youth to be served. So we mentioned that a little bit earlier, that that 3,000 per youth, 
was kind of where we arrived. And if you, if you anticipate a need to spend more than $3,000 per youth, you should put that in your budget narrative and explain that. Next slide, please. Uh, this is what you'll see once you've submitted the budget and the budget narrative. Again, on the left, you'll see, oh, um, also just to note that ROG number in that column on the top left, that is going to be the SMA number um, that you can put at the top of your expenditure report or your uh, budget template. Once you've completed that, these two tasks will be um, completed and they'll have that green check mark to the left. Then you'll need to go into task three to review and submit. When you click task three, you'll get the screen to the right, which will prompt you to go through and review, uh, sign authorized representative, date and time, and then mark as complete. This is very important. When you hit mark as complete, it is still not a submitted application. Um, when you hit mark as complete, the green, the submit button on the left uh, that's circled in red, <clears throat> in red and is gray right now, that will turn green. Um, and then you'll be able to hit that. So make sure you hit that submit button. It'll prompt you to submit and you'll get a confirmation that it's been submitted. But until you do that, it has not been submitted. So just keep that in mind. Next slide, please. So once we receive the applications, this is um, just a brief overview of how they'll be scored. So we have those six evaluation items, the questions that are scored, and they'll go to review panels. And each person in the panel will review the application and assign a score to each question of zero through four, zero being the lowest, four being the highest. Each question has a certain weight associated with it, and a calculation will be done to arrive at the points um, for each question, and the total number of points, of course, will be the application score. Next point, please, or next slide, please. Uh, so just reiterating, the final application score is the average score determined by the sum of all evaluators' weighted scores divided by a total number of evaluators per application. Um, so once that happens and once the applications receive scores, it'll move into a two-step awarding process. Um, step one will be that the highest scored application that meets the minimum score requirement per region will be awarded. And we'll get into this a little bit on the next slide, but we've divided um, the state into 11 regions for the purposes of this RFA. And that's really just to increase our geographic distribution of grants across the state. Um, so we'll have 11 regions that we'll discuss in a moment. And the highest scored application from each of those regions will be awarded first. And then the remaining applications will move into step two, uh, where they'll move into one pool that's no longer based on regions. It'll be one pool throughout the state where all applications will be um, together in that, in that competitive process and that ranking and awarding will continue. Next slide, please. So this is just showing that map uh, that we're using for the 11 regions. This is the regional solutions map out of the governor's office. You can see those 11 regions listed on the left. And the way your application will be assigned is that it will be assigned based on your established business address. Molly referenced this a little bit earlier. Um, if you enter your business address and you have a service uh, location address that's different from the business address, you can petition to submit um, your application counted in the region where you're providing service rather than your business location. So you would submit supporting documentation to the single point of contact as outlined in section 4.4.1.1 of the RFA. So if you know that that's gonna be a situation for you where your business address is different from your service region or it's a different county, um, read that section of the RFA for those instructions on how to petition to have your application counted in the county that you feel is most appropriate. Um, those requests to change your region would have to be received no later than the close of RFA, which is July 13th. Next slide, please. And this is just that screen that you'll see in SM Apply. Um, on the left are the proposed services taking place in the county selected for your business address. If you select no, you can go down here and select the counties where the services will be provided. If you select yes, those counties will disappear and that's all you'll need to do. And then on the right, uh, checkbox below if applicant organization's service location is also their business address. If you check that, it'll fill in the address and that'll be all you need to do. That is it for my slides. Do we have any, any questions or should we keep going? I know we're at two o'clock. All right, well, well, we'll definitely stay on the call and answer the questions if you uh, see me on the screen, I've, I've been trying to answer some of the questions along with Cord. Um, but uh, this is the last slide of the presentation, and it's the, this is from section 1.4 of the RFA. 
and it just outlines the key dates on that. So you'll notice that today's information session uh, is listed there, and then the questions and uh, requests for clarification are due Friday, June 25th by 1 p.m. to our SPC, which is Noemi. Again, her email is in uh, the RFA, I believe on page two or somewhere close to the top. Uh, answers to those questions, meaning that's a piece that uh, as um, re-engagement staff, we will be aiding uh, in responding to some of those questions. That'll be published uh, around Friday, July 2nd, and that will be published on the YDD website on that piece. Uh, and then there's, you'll notice the ineligible entity appeal, which is outlined in section 1.3 of the RFA. Uh, that appeal is due by Wednesday, June 30th, if you're not an eligible entity and wishing to apply for re-engagement grants. Uh, the closing, as well as a request to change region, is Tuesday, July 13th uh, at 1 p.m. So uh, with that, uh, you can notice that our anticipated reimbursement is from July 1, as well as the first reporting cycle, October 1. Um, we'll jump back into some questions. Uh, I know that we have a lot of people on the call and that we do want to honor your time. So we appreciate you greatly for joining us today. And uh, like I said earlier, we will definitely stay on the call and try to answer as many questions as we can uh, for that. Uh, I'll turn it back to Cord for some questions as I, I need to hit enter on one of the responses. I'll let you hit enter and see which one it is before I start reading these in case you've answered one I'm about to. I have a few I flagged because I'm not sure the answer. I tried to answer those I could. Okay. Yeah. I just, so the one that I just answered was what is the difference between re engagement and youth promise grants in terms of serving students at risk of disengagement? Uh, my response was re engagement grants have specific requirements for re engagement funds, such as eligible youth and educational components that differ from the community. Um, oops, I said, process community investment, excuse me for the typo on that. Um, but uh, so they, the requirements are a bit different on that. So just um, looking at the RFA will help clarify that for applicants. Um, so the one that I'm a little confused about, I may have been typing when this was talked about, a few questions about how to determine how the $3,000 per youth, um, how that would cover when you served. Um, can anyone talk about this? My understanding is that sort of a bit to be a round about estimate for what we're looking at? Absolutely. I think, thank you for bringing that up for some clarification. So there isn't any specific cap, um, but we are looking to, for if, if you're going to serve more, if it's going to cost more than 3,000 per youth um, served, because you will report the number of youth served for each quarter. And if that's going to exceed that over the course of the biennium, then you would want to definitely outline that in your budget narrative. So for example, if you're serving 10 youth, uh, that 3,000 cap would would put you well under the, the maximum allowance for the grants, but if you needed additional funds to be able to serve it because you were doing services that cost more than that for that individual youth, then you'd want to help like that in the budget narrative specifically on that. And maybe Jared and Molly might add some clarity to that. I don't know how clear, <laughs> clear I was on that response. No, I think you just said exactly what I was going to say. Okay, perfect. Um, there was a question that I, I may have, I think that it maybe is referring to a table within the application where you're kind of estimating the number of youth receiving services. And I, I think I was trying to answer it and, and maybe didn't help. So the question is, um, do you want youth counted as receiving services in each column? So if one youth is receiving multiple different services, um, is that youth being counted repeatedly in each column for the services delivered? Um, can anyone maybe maybe help help me clarify this one? I might be able to help. Um, so on the projected outcomes chart, if I'm if I'm understanding the question, we understand um, that there'll be some duplication in numbers. We we do want the organizations to lean towards what the, um, the primary service is. But in a re-engagement program where there's a lot of different services that the individual youth is going to be accessing, you definitely would be counting um, that in the different re-engagement categories. So for example, you might have conducted outreach to a youth, and so that will be counted in the outreach line. That particular youth might earn some high school credit or pass a GED test, so that's going to be counted in you know, that cr credential attainment and progress line. 
Um, and then I think I saw the question where, well, our partner is going to be doing some services and we're going to be doing others. And so that's fair. Um, what we're trying to understand is how many youth are going to be impacted by these re-engagement programs um, is, is kind of the purpose that we're trying to get and to see how many, how many youth will be served, basically. Paul, did you have anything to add to that? I think you answered that very well, so thank you. Um, cool. So um, I, oh, I think sorry. there was some questions about just the address issue. Um, you know, if a program is trying to serve youth in other uh, regions, I suppose. Uh, so confused about the whole address issue now, our organization wants to provide programming in several regions, counties in Oregon. Um, I don't know, if maybe the question is, um, what if an applicant wants to provide services in multiple regions or multiple counties? Jared, is that something you want to turn to add or would you like me to? It's up to you. Yeah, I think um, that's, yeah, so we, we understand that there are grantees who will provide services in, in multiple regions. I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Paul, but um, you would just submit the documentation to the single point of contact for the region in which you would like to be considered. Um, so it, that could be the region where you're serving the most youth. Um, is that is that correct, Paul? That's yes, that's correct. And um, and also keep in mind that the the regional piece is is only for um, aiding us as a as an agency to really expand our regional distribution of grants. And so we're focused on trying to get it into those uh, grants into each of those eleven regions. Outside of that, it'll be ranked in order and scored in order of application score. So um, if you're serving the most youth in Multnomah, that would probably be where you'd want to, to submit that, right? Because that's where your majority of the youth are served. So great answer, Jared. On that. So, um, so I'm working on a question right now. Uh, if someone is writing the, oh, excuse me, I got the wrong one. So um, what if you have more than one partner? How many letters? Can be submitted. So SMO apply will allow you to submit as many letters as you currently have there. If you have more um, partners' plans and just don't have the letters or, or are not uploading it, that's that is fine. A minimum of one is required. Um, so yeah, you'll be able to choose which ones you want. Uh, you can also outline those in your question response um, or evaluation question response. On that. Uh, the other question was: Is if someone is writing these online grants for separate organizations? Um, on that, I do not know the answer to that. Uh, if you can have multiple login accounts in SMFY, so that's a technical question. I'd like to maybe see if Abe or Bill might know the answer to that one. I I, I believe the answer is yes to that, but I'll let someone else say. Um, I know in the past we've had uh, an individual apply on behalf of two different entities. Just make sure that the application is is really clear about who is applying. Yeah, it's it's possible. Just kind of what you just said, Accord. Right now, uh, it is possible to apply with two different and as long as you can distinguish when you're writing in the grant that has kind of the same email in the line. Oops, I just scrolled did the one thing. Uh, so can current youth being served in a re-engagement grant continue if the program is funded again? This is going to be a conversation I think we need to have uh, as a grants team, but if they have not completed the high school uh, completion option, absolutely, they can be picked up within that. Uh, we have not discussed as a team what those deadlines look like in terms of completion and, and access. And so we will need to discuss that and get that uh, more clarity to that uh, out uh, at the Q&A. Um, looking through the other questions. Uh, so if we are submitting requests in two grant categories, do they need to be different to you? So that's um, you. We would want to make sure that you're not using the same funds to serve the same youth for the same purpose. And so the, the a successful grantee would have to be able to distinguish between the two grant types and the programs within it. So some grants may support similar youth or the same youth because they're serving different programs and different uh, supports within that. So uh, that would be a piece that you would definitely want to be aware of uh, when you're doing those applications for sure. Uh, I'm scrolling back up. And do please keep adding the information or questions if you need um, clarity on things. Can 
There was a one uh, uh, can current youth being served in a reengagement grant be um, continue in, in the program if they are funded again and counted as the part of that number served. Uh, concurrent, yes. So if they have not completed high school, yeah, absolutely they can continue forward. Uh, we will need to have some more discussion about when the dates are, if they completed, how that looks uh, in terms of continuing services. We have not talked about that as a team yet. So a new question um, got added. Um, sounds like it's regarding this table. Um, I, don't, I, I mean, we're kind of on the spot. I think that it might be helpful for us to come together and maybe develop like sort of a sample of, of what that table might look like that kind of helps clarify some of this um we appreciate you kind of you know really trying to get some clarity from us and we might be able to do that better if we talk about it internally i i agree i was just reading that question still not understanding how you want count youth counted as receiving services in, in your two columns um, so yeah we'll we'll take a look at that in a closer piece and try to add some detail to that question Appreciate the positive comments. People are shouting out as they're signing off. So thank you. Um, a question that just popped up. How do we identify a number of youth supported who benefit from re-engagement through restorative practices within a school program? So that's a great question. <laughs> um, so I think one of the things that, to keep in mind with those as we're identifying those numbers are they're absolutely estimates for the work that you're doing. So if you're working in the school district, sometimes school districts have general numbers, um, you know, like for the re-engagement program, if you're looking specifically at that, what are your typical numbers that you've served in the past uh, around those eligible youth? So just kind of some, some guidelines on, on the anticipated use. Those numbers we understand will adjust um, and, and we're still coming out of the COVID area, so we don't know how everything will look as we keep coming out of that. So um, it's just kind of your best estimate in terms of how you can address those. I think one thing I would say too, and um, Abe, maybe you want to touch on this, like if your project is really like more of a systems or school-wide type of project where you're not really looking at individual level service, it may be that a grant from our community investment side, the youth solutions grant could be more appropriate. Um, it, it, if, it, um, if it helps, I mean, Abe, can you just quickly talk about that sure. grant and how it differs from this in terms of looking at, well, system versus individual level service? Yes, I can talk a little bit about that. That's kind of the idea behind the solution grant in regards to providing some of that flexibility. What I would suggest is to go ahead and review that, uh, kind of the description of what it entails because I think that might be somewhere where it may be more helpful and beneficial to kind of um, be able to see how that may actually uh, may benefit the program and what you're thinking of doing perhaps. Um, that's the intention behind that, that at least the solutions. It's, it's the idea of being more flexible for the different types of programming that are happening. Yeah, thanks. And I'm answering this question at the bottom about, you know, generally should it amount requested scale to the number of students served or is the nature of the program an equivalent factor if the cost of programming is high? We understand that the cost per youth can vary widely, definitely. Um, the nature of the program is an important factor and a higher cost per youth may be explained in your application. So um, if, if it is something involving like, for instance, expensive equipment around, um, you know, technology or, or, you know, CTE type programming, um, that's something that you could talk about in your application. You know, we're, we're uh, definitely looking to have, I think programs tell us um, what the cost is to do what they are trying to do and why they think that will be successful intervention. All right, so I see a couple kind of last minute questions and we're about uh, 2.15. So we'll probably start wrapping up some of the questions because I think we do need to add some detail to some of these. Um, so you can find both the re-engagement Opportunity grants uh, application under uh, on our website under the youth reengagement tab at the top of the screen. We also can find the community uh, investment, which includes the youth solutions, the youth promise, workforce, and um, youth violence and gang prevention um, grants under the community investment grants. And I think I said one of the names wrong, so I apologize for that. But uh, so please do visit the website for all that information. Uh, regarding that. And uh, Joe, just kind of wrap up, we appreciate again everybody's time for joining us today.
um, as we kind of move forward, just to kind of give a concept of where we are with these grants, we're anticipating around 25 or so grants, depending on the amount of requests that come in. Um, so I, we do anticipate this being a fairly competitive grant process and look forward to you joining and, and submitting the applications within that. Again, um, if you have any questions after we shut down this webinar, please do send them to Noemi and her email address and contact information is on page one of the RFA on the cover page for you to access. With that, I um, didn't know if anybody else would like to say a quick word. All right. Thank you all for joining us. Thanks, Brad. Thanks, Bill. All right. And we will have this posted here uh, later next week for your review, should you uh, want to follow up. Thanks a lot and have a great rest of your Thursday.